This podcast is a proud member of the Lamb Podcasting Network. Find the network at largeassmovieblogs.com. Hello and welcome to episode 63 of the 1001 Movies podcast, based on the book 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die. This week marks the beginning of the second half of the fourth season of the show and starts with Love Me Tonight, a romantic comedy musical from 1932, directed by Ruben Mamoulian. Count, I'm going to bed. I just came up to join you. Join me? Join you in a little chat before dinner. Not tonight. I've had another fainting spell, and my uncle the Duke thought bed was the best place for me. I always think that, if one isn't well. Count, why the ladder? Well, it's more romantic. Oh, careful. Oh, I brought along my flute, hoping to entertain. No, Count. Not tonight. Oh, before I go, you remember what I said to you down by the horse trough? Quite well. What was it? I simply wished to see if it made any impression on you, Princess. You said I love you. Made no impression, whatever. There would probably be no use of repeating the sentiment at this time. None at all. Oh, Princess, I trust you do not find my wooing too ardent? I was just admiring your restraint. Good night, Carl. I'm with the dreams, Princess. <clears throat> oh, 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 oh! Oh, I'll never be able to use it again. Oh, Count, did you break your leg? No, I fell flat on my flute. Chances are that you've never heard of Ruben Mamillion, although even if you're not a cinephile, you've probably heard of such films of his like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and The Mark of Zorro. Born in what was then part of the Russian Empire in 1897, Mamillion's career started, much as Bob Fosse's did, with the theater. Mamillion moved to London in 1922, where he directed some stage plays, before being hired by George Eastman of the Kodak Company to direct the Eastman School's opera training program, as well as the Rochester American Opera Company. Mamoulian also joined New York's Theatre Guild, which, together with the Provincetown Playhouse, produced the stage play Porgy in 1927, based on Dorothy and DuBose Hayward's novel of the same name. Now, Mamoulian directed the play and earned himself critical acclaim in and around Broadway as a result. Many years later, in the late 1950s, he would be hired and subsequently fired on the making of the film adaptation of Porgy and Bess, the Gershwin opera based on the play. Mamoulian's Porgy premiered just four days before the opening of The Jazz Singer, the film that ushered in Hollywood's era of sound. The movies were a burgeoning industry, with studios growing in both Los Angeles and New York. Mamoulian was approached by Paramount Pictures, probably intrigued by his success on Broadway, and offered him a seven-year contract under which he would initially work as a sound coach. This was the first instance of Ruben Mamoulian facing down the studio, and he told executives Jess Lasky and Walter Wenger that he would only direct for them. He refused to sign a contract, and that, quote, when I tell you I'm ready, I'm ready. After spending several weeks observing filmmakers at their craft at Paramount Studios, he eventually went back to Lasky and Wenger and told them that he would direct a film based on a script he had read called Applause. If this sounds like a surprisingly lackadaisical method of making a movie, remember that the industry was still young, and studios had not quite gotten to the point where they could control the personal and professional lives of their talent via a strict contractual system. The creative process itself was almost left entirely in the hands of the filmmakers, a rare occasion nowadays. While the making of applause seemed unconventional, the plot seemed equally so. 
The main character is a burlesque dancer named Kitty, who, after raising her daughter amongst prostitutes and bootleggers, sends her off to a convent. Released in 1929, this obviously wasn't popular Hollywood fare at the time, and despite some critical success, the movie bombed. The studio, however, appreciated Mamoulian's creative style, and he was asked again to direct, this time a gangster drama starring Gary Cooper and Sylvia Sidney called City Streets. This film proved to be much more of a success than applause. Although both films contain many elements Mamoulian learned from the silent film era, not to mention camera techniques that were more expressionistic than a typical Hollywood film. Mamoulian dove headfirst into making his next film, which is arguably his most popular, 1931's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He had complete control over both the script and the direction, and it shows. Although the 1941 version starring Spencer Tracy seems to pervade the American zeitgeist more, Mamoulian's version is arguably the better one, exploring the nature of the male psyche, the fracture between the id and the ego, and its effect on sexuality. The film cemented the remainder of Mamoulian's long career, and equally so for star Frederick March, who won an Academy Award for Best Actor. And so it came to pass that Mamoulian made Love Me Tonight, based on the play of the same name by Paul Armand. Where Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was a film about repulsion and aggression, Love Me Tonight was about attraction and gratification. A musical comedy, it's the story of Maurice, played by Maurice Chevier, a Parisian tailor who travels to a country estate to collect on a debt. There he is tra attracted by Princess Jeannette, played by Jeannette MacDonald, who initially rebuffs him, but after a series of merry misadventures and songs, eventually falls under a spell in a dramatic conclusion involving a train. Love Me Tonight, like most of Mamillion's previous films, was a resounding success, and he would go on to make films such as Queen Christina and Laura, although he was fired during making the latter, both of which are subjects for other podcast episodes. What did I think of Love Me Tonight? One of Mamillion's early trademarks was an interesting opening montage, such as the protagonist's point of view in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or the roving camera over the dance hall in applause. The opening of Love Me Tonight is no exception, although I've read that it was inspired by a Rene Clair film. It opens on an early morning in a Paris street, where a workman begins digging into the stone, followed by the snoring of a sleeping drunk, And then a woman comes out to sweep her stoop. The factory workers begin tapping. The denizens awake. Carpenter saws. A woman beats a carpet against a balcony. A pair of cobblers hammer away. And the traffic goes by noisily. All of this evolves into a pleasant cacophony, reminding me of Chicago's cell block tango. Later, uh, Maurice and his customer begin singing Isn't It Romantic, a song known by many as sung by Ella Fitzgerald, but it was introduced here. 
As Maurice and his customer sing, the song is picked up and sung by a man getting into a taxi. The taxi driver sings it. It's picked up by another client of the driver and is sung by one person after another across the countryside until it reaches Princess Jeanette singing alone on her balcony. If you've listened to my earlier episodes, you'll know that I am not a fan of musicals, but this really tickled me. Had it been introduced in a modern-day film, I would have been equally delighted. Overall, it's a really clever way to convey the charm of a piece of music. Of the music in the remainder of the film, I shall not speak much of, because it's largely forgettable. As though the writers blew all of their lyrical talent in the first 15 minutes of the picture. Where they lack in music, however, they make up for in wit, which is why some have called this movie an Ernst Lubitsch musical. Double entendre and repartee abound, which is quite good, but the love story is as implausible as any other from the early 1930s. Princess Jeanette is initially uninterested in Maurice, and then magically falls in love with him just moments before the film's silly conclusion, which I shall not spoil for you, but it involves a train, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Everyone seems to be having fun making this picture, from the two leads, the trio of gossipy ants, the elderly C. Aubrey Smith, and I swear he must have looked 70 years old even when he was 20, and Myrna Loy as the Countess Valentine. This is a shame, as the movie seems to get bogged down into how cute it must be. While the snarky commentary on France is wealthy is a highlight, there's a short scene with a bridge game that struck me as downright hilarious, when it wavers into French farce, it just barely fails for me. Nevertheless, I can understand why this picture has something of a cult status among fans of 1930s musical cinema, and would highly recommend it if you're the slightest bit interested. Chances are you'll earn far more pleasure from it than that cold, dark place reserved in my own heart, which is reserved exclusively for screaming children in public and silly romantic musicals. That's all I have to say about Love Me Tonight. Now tune in next week when I discuss 1946's It's a Wonderful Life, directed by Frank Capra. In the meantime, feel free to email me any questions or comments at 1001moviespodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at 1001moviespc, or look for the podcast's Facebook page. Until next time, happy viewing. (laughs) 